right, so uh, I'm back with uh, doing another uh, Creative Courage with a good friend of mine, Craig Gilotti. He is the principal at LGA Architecture here in Las Vegas. And he and I go way back and we have collaborated professionally on creative projects and personally on creative projects. And uh, we, we, we hang out every, when it's on a good, on a good, time, a good day, if it's every month, you know, we tried to back when things were a little more normal uh, to get together to play some, I don't know if you'd call it music, but it's, it's <laughs> we'd, we'd play, play our instruments and make some fun noise and it's always a blast. But this is Craig Galati. So Craig, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do. Well, yeah, thanks Alex. Um, well, I've been uh, a long time Las Vegas and uh, grew up here and I went away to college, I came back and I been uh, worked for a number of different firms before I became a partner at uh, LGA. Uh, which I've been since 1988. Um, and uh, we have a 17-person architectural practice here in Las Vegas and uh, have uh, kind of think, think of ourselves as designing the conversation starting projects in, in Southern Nevada. Well, you guys are a real, you got a really creative team um, that I've had the pleasure to meet, you know, all of them. And, and there's a lot of talent in that group. And your approach to projects, I think, is really interesting because you're, you're very much, uh, you're about, you're very much about the processes and, and discussing the processes and, and, and having a purpose in the act of architecture. Uh, you know, the end result is, is obviously great, but it's very much motivated by a lot more than just what the structure is. Um, and, I'm, and, I, and in terms of what we're talking about, which is creativity, I think that's very intriguing. Can you talk about a little bit about your approach to projects and, 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 and what yeah. you look for? Cer certainly. You know, you know, Alex, one of the things that I noticed a long time ago when I was early in my career is that while most architects think of a building as a sculpture or a piece of art, to me, it's much, much more. Now, I'm not going to minimize the sculptural qualities or the architecture or the correct use of materials. Those are all very, very important. But what I think signifies architecture is it not so much what it looks like, it's what it does. It's how it um, allows an organization or the public to interact with it and to create something greater than the piece of architecture. And so we've always have looked at architecture from a people perspective and um, how does what we do enhance the, um, the organization or the people that are moving in and out of the space? And, you know, at the same time, it has to sit on the land as light as possible in our minds. And so we try to um, blend into the context and into the site and utilize natural materials, natural light, um, and really try to minimize our impact on the earth when we design these projects. So it's kind of a, a dual thing for, for me. It's about really about people, but then it's also about protecting the earth that we have such a great opportunity to build upon. So every single project gets that treatment. Yes. And that's, that's pretty kind of cool. It, 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 it's, it's interesting to kind of have that goal right before working on a thing that's so broad and, and kind of, in a lot of ways, kind of powerful. I think, I think it's, it's funny because it kind of taps into a little bit. I rewatched one of the interviews I did with my former art teacher, Tom Dowling. I, I'd love for you to watch that one because yeah. he's a fine artist and um, not as in like he's a good artist. He's, he's into fine art. And he, mm -hmm. we were talking about art in terms of, of what it meant. Because one of the things I was always trying to pull out of him for the, for the years I've known him is like, um, what is your art trying to say? And he always pushed back on, it's not important what it's trying to say. It's important what happens when you relate with it. When you, when you see it and the experience that you have with it, that's what he's shooting for, is what, what is, the, is, is that moment. And it's, it's different for everyone. And I get a little taste of that from listening to you talk about architecture, it's that, that it's about the experience of the people that they, that they have with the space. And um, sometimes that is actually more important, but also more abstract and hard to kind of wrap your arms around 
and requires a lot of work to, tr to even find that. Um, but it seems like that's a little bit sometimes, maybe maybe in terms of how, it, that it's sometimes more important than the actual. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, you know, it's funny, when, when we were really starting to hone our craft in this process, um, we really started studying sociology and actually had a number of different sociologists that worked either on our projects or in the firm. And one of the, the things that we learned is that you can't necessarily control somebody's behavior. You, you're not, that's not what you're there for. But what you're there for is to set it up so that they can get the best experience that's possible for them. And everybody's idea of what a, a great experience is is a little bit different. Now we can impact that through sight and through sound and through smell and through other senses to help put impact on certain experiences. But what I think we're really trying to do is to not have latent consequences within the project. So to develop these um, paths that are able to be um, used by people differently or, um, or a space that can be experienced by somebody differently, but yet doesn't create these negative kind of effects to it. And so we're, that's how we really kind of approach it. We have a kind of a, a process, just stray a little bit and talk about process, but mm -hmm. um, we call it the adroit. It's, um, it's a, something that's kind of used in planning and interpretive planning more so than it has been in architecture, but we've applied it to architecture. And when we think about a space, um, the adroit stands for arrival, decompression, reception, orientation, interpretation, and transformation. And those are the paths through a building or through a space, and they are what creates the experiences. So if you, if you take and say, okay, I, I need an arrival sequence, then I need to decompress somebody to be able to receive this new experience that we're going to create for them. I've got to receive them and make them feel welcome. I've got to orient, help them orient themselves to the space or to the things they want to find or want to see. And then there's this opportunity for either information or interpretation. Interpretation is more of kind of a museum word, but, um, or information. Um, and then at the end of the day, when they leave or when they um, remember the experience, we want them to be transformed. We want that whatever they came to get, they got in such a way that they, you know, left feeling different than when they came in. Mm -hmm. So we'll take that process and we'll run every project through that process. But we don't stop there. We recognize that there are different people that are going to be experiencing that. So we try to develop different personas. And so we'll say, um, all right, well, how does a kid feel? And we'll walk through the adroit as a child. We'll walk through the adroit as, a, um, as an adult. Try to walk through it as a, you know, different racial experiences to the extent that we can. We'll also walk through it as a, as a genderly. How does a woman feel here different than a man? Or um, how do people feel accepted and feel right in these spaces? And so we'll try to design it that way by looking at all those components through our adroit process. I hope that makes sense. No, it does. It totally makes sense. It's actually really intriguing to think the process you go through to do architecture would be an amazing process to use for other things in terms of problem solving and, and whatever it is that anybody's working on. It seems like that approach would be relevant to almost everything. Yeah, right? I would agree with that. I mean, you think about just... Uh, when we, uh, when our, when our little group goes out and plays one of these days, <laughs> we should, group. Hey, you know, you, some of us are a big part of the group, but yeah, I know <laughs> <what you're saying. laughs> we, we should, we should design that whole sequence of a person's experience of hearing us play and, and suffering. It's a, art we, is about suffering after all. <laughs> <laughs> but if we, but if we, we, we have a good arrival sequence right. and we get a good kind of, reception and orientation to what the heck we're doing, we will Here we, go. Here we go. Okay, yeah, you're right, I know. You're always doing this. You're, you, you know, you're the, uh, my nickname for Craig is the Enigma, uh, the Gladiator. 
Craig Galati, the guy, the guy who's always searching for a way to to make it make make the band. It's not even a band; it's a club. We always talk about it. It's not really a band; it's a club. But um, but anyway, we will do this when when the, you know what people are waiting for live music now. You know, so maybe maybe we need to launch. <laughs> and and I and I think if this we our sing, time. if we if we sing through masks, we can only be better. <laughs> that's a very good that's a very good point that's a very good point so one of the things i actually wanted to, to ask you about i don't think we've ever actually talked about this i know that when you were younger like i um you explored a lot of crates creative things and you know both of us were in bands um uh you you uh i think you went probably a little bit further than i did and with the bands i think that you probably um ex- stuck with it a little longer than i did but um but you know and i explored art and painting and and writing and stuff like that and i know you've done a lot of, of things as well so mm-hmm. when you were young and because uh, i'm saying I'm, I'm delving in here because I, I i know i have some young people that watch some of the stuff i i produce and i put out there and i have some educators uh that, that watch some of the things i put on youtube um i'd like to see if uh, talk to people about something that might feel relatable to them because i like the fact that when people hear uh, they have this want of how to express themselves and they find someone seasoned and then they learn something from them they go wait a minute that's what i felt and it encouraged them to, to keep going and keep trying because it's so easy to be pulled off track mm-hmm. when you're trying to search for something. So what are your, what, what were your feelings or things relatable? Or maybe when you talk to young architects, is there something relatable? And, and, and well, you know, you know, it's funny. It's funny. Um, I always love to draw mm-hmm. and um, I was constantly drawing, you, you know, you probably, some people would call them doodling. Some people would call whatever it might be, but, um, it was a way for me to process um, and think. And so I developed a really strong connection between my brain and my hand. And I think that helps me learn. I, I can't learn without either sketching or writing at the same time. And to me, that they are so interconnected. And I would say that, that kids should draw. They should draw all day and they should paint and they should experiment and not care what it comes out like, that's not the point. The mm-hmm. point is the process of learning how to do it. And I have dabbled in everything. I have done ceramics. I've done woodwork. Um, I've done um, uh, watercolor. I've done acrylic. Um, I've done life drawing, uh, charcoal drawing. Um, I know how to use markers. I mean, all those things that I've learned over all these years I think they've made me a better architect because I think I can touch something and feel it um, that way. And, you know, I mean, I even did jewelry making for a while in college. And I mean, that's a whole nother medium that I never thought about. But I, and and what I made was not really very good, but the process of it and learning about different materials and learning about different things, I think it expands your mind so that you don't get just pigeonholed as an architect per, per se, or, or, or a marketer or anything. You know, you, getting pigeonholed, I think, is what really keeps us from reaching our potential. And so I know that everybody's into computers and wants to draw on computers and do all that stuff. And that's fine and dandy. There's, some, there's art in that as well, and I don't disagree with it, but I don't think we should disregard the connection between brain and hand. And um, I think that makes you a, a better visual artist all the way around and a, just a better thinker. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, again, you're tapping a little bit into what, we, what I discussed with my art teacher about, um, yeah, that people are, the medium is changing and people are, but the medium is, is it's a convenience medium. And sometimes the best ideas come from the inconvenience of working on something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, the discomfort, some, I believe that sometimes it requires a little bit of a struggle to get to a thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think it was, uh, Jack, it was a, uh, his name Jack White, right? From the White Stripes. Uh-huh. He, uh, I think he was talking about that he used to use or still does maybe this, 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 this could guitar from, I think it was like Japanese guitar that was like $40 and it was, it was plastic and it was hard to get sounds out of it, but he loved playing it because it forced him to really squeeze the music out of it. You know, it, it was hard. 
And in the hardness of, of the work, something great came out of that. And I, I think there's, um, uh, I, I don't, for some reason, that's coming to mind um, for, for, for uh, you know, about that, that the processes so, because, because of the ease, ease of using that. You, you're, so, you're so right. You know, it's funny. Um, uh, over this uh, last few months, I've been moving. So I packed up uh, my electric guitars and all my equipment and I, hadn't, I didn't have access to that for a couple of months. But I did have access to my acoustic. And so I've been playing it a lot more. And playing an acoustic guitar is a hell of a lot harder than playing <laughs> an electric guitar. Right. Well, and, yeah. and I think that's exactly what, what Jack White is talking about, is that you have to be crisp and you cannot slide a fret and, you know, do the stuff we do on electric guitar um, the same way. You have to be pure, yeah. more pure on an acoustic. And I think if you practice on an acoustic, you become a better guitar player. I, I truly believe it. And you know, maybe that's something I should be doing a lot more. So, so just for more information for people who, who don't know about this. So many years ago, um, I just reached out on social media to, to my friends on social media and said, hey, and I was basically looking for people who are failed rock stars, <laughs> people who when they were young were playing in bands and everything and who still miss it and wanted to get together just to jam, just to have fun, and just to, with with actually no no preconceptions or or expectations, just have a safe space where you could show up and play, and and that you and I and a few other people got involved in the early days of just kind of sitting in your office back back in the day, and you know you had the huge beautiful space that we were able to play in, and it was a fun idea, and the whole time that we've been doing this. You and I were the, are the consistent ones who stuck with it from the beginning. Um, you know, unfortunately, one of the, one of the, also the people who's consistent we lost recently is Harry Ray. We lost him, who was our drummer. And, uh, but, but um, that's unfortunate, but, but, but you and I have been consistent in, in trying to do this. And it's funny because even though it was my intent to just make this a free form exploration, having the courage going forward, which I believe I have that, You've kind of been the champion of that since the beginning because you are fearless about everything that we do on this. Thing. And you've always wanted to go push it. Let's push it. Let's try this. And it's such a, a cathartic, fun, freeing experience when we get together to play because there is literally low, such low expectations, but a want to make it sound so great that that coupling of those two things create some great moments. You know what I mean? It's, I, think, I think it's probably some of the most fun I've had in probably the last decade are the moments that we've gotten together, uh, drinking some of the beer that you brew and playing some music. And, and I, you know, aside from appreciating that you're willing to stick with it, I'm, I thank for your encouragement on, on the, this thing because part of it, part of me thinks that the only reason it still exists is because of you. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. But you know, you know, the, you know, the funny thing about it, Alex, is that, um, you know, I had not played in a really long time and you reached out to me and I remember I was like, oh man, I'm not going to be good enough. I'm not going to be good enough. I was so worried that the first day I went to your house yeah, and we set up and started to play a little bit. And then I just kind of felt comfortable because you had a way of encouraging um, trial and error. And, and to me, that's what has been the fun about this. I mean, we will walk into a, a night and we'll say, we're going to play this song. And before you know it, we've written three songs, <laughs> including, including lyrics right. uh, and have honed them a little bit. And in three hours, there's some magic that comes out of that. Right. Now the, the sad thing is, is that we could never recreate that moment. <laughs> Yeah, um, but it's also but, beautiful. <laughs> I think that's it, pretty cool. But yeah, but it, it it's it's almost like you know we're we're going to become the next string cheese incident because <laughs> they they never have the same concert right because they don't remember what they play, right. and um, <laughs> you know it's funny how we start out with something and before we know it we're going somewhere and then all of a sudden we're just in sync, and you just go how did that happen? Because none of us play the same. We all have a little bit different styles. We have, you know, different, you know, we grew up listening, some same music, but also very different music. 
and to even today we listen to different music. And so how, how does this happen? And I think it's about, and I, I think this is relevant. I'm, I'm actually going to make a real point here. No, it's fine. I like this. But, the, but when you talk about creative courage, that's what this is. Yeah. That's what it is. It's, it's setting away all pretenses to allow something to happen. And if you don't create the right environment for creativity, it won't happen. And what I think we've been able to do, and initially you has been able to make us all feel comfortable enough to fail and to fail either on the guitar or on the vocal. I remember the first couple of times I, I tried singing a little bit and you said, Oh, quit singing from your throat. Start singing from here. Yeah. And, and be, be, be one with the vocal, you know, and it's like, wow, what, what a difference it makes. And it, the same thing with the guitar, you know, I, I know I was probably a lot more timid at first, um, and hid behind the effects, right? So, but I, and I think it's, I think it's getting better every, every time we do it. Even if our time goes by, the next time we get together, we just kick right back off. And I think it's the environment for creativity that is allowing us to do this. And, and the other side of it too is because we've been doing it for a long time, we have this intuition now where, where you, you will do something and, and I, I anticipate your your progressions and everything and then i think you do mine mm -hmm. and i think it's interesting because i think bands that have been around and worked together for a long time also have this where they're able to kind of that's why we i mean it's happened um hundreds of times where we'll start with me playing a chord progression then you add something to it and then i'll keep going and then we find a bridge and we create a bridge and then you start throwing in lyrics and then you know you have that magic book of lyrics of songs that you've written when you're young that's like full of like gold, you know, and some of it is hilarious because, you know, it's coming from a younger mind. And now when we read it as old guys, you know, we're like, God, I love that. That's so, you know, that's the thing that I love about it is you do feel like, you know, and I'll tell the story because I, you know, I, I told the story um, at the at the Harry's Memorial, but I love it. I love the moment when, you, when all three of us, we just went into, I think it was all along the watchtower, but we totally changed it. And we're playing and we're going and it was perfect. It sounded so great. And the chords were clean and Harry was on time for once, you know, and <laughs> we were all going and we're all jiving and I'm looking at you and you're nodding to me and I'm looking at Harry. He's like, yeah, let's go. And we're rocking. And we're like all feeling like we're 20 again and we're playing and we're feeling fantastic. And then all of a sudden the waiter from the restaurant next door breaks into the room and says, rock on old dudes. <laughs> And it and it brought us all back to oh yeah we're yeah. a bunch of old dudes, <laughs> but it was but it was really bad. it was like it was like a time machine. The 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 the, the act of doing it it's, it it very much is like a time machine. It absolutely is a time machine, and yeah. it's it's the time machine I'm missing right now. I, I you know I, I can't wait till we can figure out how to get back together and play. And yeah, um, I, I don't think it'll be long uh, before we'll be able to. And, Besides, yeah. we, we, we really don't stand any closer than six feet apart anyway. So Yeah, usually, no, and we're doing that. Yeah, so I think we'll have to figure it. We have to all come up with ideas on how to figure these things out. I think it was suggested by Levi that, you know, uh, that we could play at his house on the driveway. <laughs> That'd be okay with me, too. We might even yeah. have, uh, we would put a little hat out in the front, maybe make a buck or two. <laughs> make, make a couple bucks. Why not? <laughs> Why not? But, um, but yeah, so, so um uh, so yeah, that was a little bit of a segue from what we we're talking about. But I, I I like the fact what you and I are, are you know we're 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 I I think we're close to the same age. You might be a little older than me, I think. Uh, but but we we kind of grew up in the same period of time, you know, in the '80s, listening to that kind of stuff. In the '80s was was the birth time, kind of early '80s and late '70s of punk rock and and this this age of experimenting and kind of trying to throw away the norms and dive into things fearlessly. And, and not be afraid of perception and just really express yourself. And I know it got attached to a lot of things that were political and a lot of different things were attached to it, but the act of, that inspired people in those days to, to, to go up against the norms, I think was important. The subversive behavior people have towards the norms is something I think we're feeling now I think usually it's 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 inspired by youth who is looking at the older team and, or older groups and saying, "You guys don't know what you're doing. You guys have absolutely no idea what you're doing." 
we're going to we're going to change that. And but there, if that does require courage and it requires a willingness to fail. Uh, but on the other end, we've all done that and made those mistakes <laughs> and hope that they listen to some advice going forward. But I'm always yeah. encouraged when I see that from young people, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. I, you know, it's funny. Um, I did this whole big webinar about preparing uh, museums to reopen mm. and, and how would they attract the people. And it's so funny. I, I, so I, I, I gave it to my son, who is a young marketer, just graduated from college about a year ago. Right. And so I was so proud to tell him and stuff. And he, so he comes back, he says, that's a fantastic webinar. He said, the only thing about it is that people my age are not afraid to go back right now. We don't need convincing to go. We just need the places to be open. We're not afraid of it because it's just who we are and where we're at in our lives. He said, the only people that are really afraid of this are older people because you're the most vulnerable too. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was just a funny perspective effective to me because I spent all this time and energy and weeks and preparing this webinar all based on the fact that people were going to be afraid to go out to um, two cultural institutions. And that's probably, um, it's probably not, not an accurate thing either. So yeah. just an interesting for, thing. Yeah, for some, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there's this anxiety and anxiousness that people have to get back to normal and, and things. I think that's totally, no, that, that makes, total sense but the the addressing what you were addressing in the webinar is still very relevant because there is caution and, and fear and not knowing when and how to approach it and 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 especially in terms of of places where people come you know come together and, and experience a thing together you know whether it's a show or a gallery or you know or or anything there's this there's this want that uh, people, you know, it's a, it's a fear because those are some of our best moments is when we gather in large groups and experience things together, you know, whether it's a concert or whatever. And we'll get back there, you know, we'll get back there. Yeah. But boy, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of work. It's what's really hard right now and where I'm struggling and, and we'll get through this, but my whole practice is based on designing those kinds of places. Places mm -hmm. for gathering, places that draw people together, places that or for the public to enjoy and be there in groups. And, you know, I keep thinking a lot about well, how will that change and, or is it just an overreaction right now? Maybe it won't really change over time. Maybe things, um, may, I mean, there's still going to be certain change that's going to happen, but I think this is where our creativity is um, really came about. You know, in one of the things that I, I'm really proud of our, our firm is that, you know, we've had a lot of work stop over the course of this pandemic because most of our clients are public clients and there's not a lot of revenue right now. Um, but we could sit there and just say, all right, we'll wait for it to come back. We said, what could we do to be helpful right now? How could we be thoughtful? That's why we did the webinar. So we did, we did a fireside chat where we invited um, a headmaster from the Meadows School, the CEO of the Nevada Museum of Art, the CEO of the Discovery Children's Museum, and the director of strategic planning from the Las Vegas Library District. We brought them all together to talk about what they're doing and how other groups could, could follow in their footsteps and what could they learn from each other. We have another webinar coming on next week where we've taken it to the next step about how do we create the best experience in this new world now mm -hmm. in these cultural institutions. So we could have just sat back and said, oh, woe is me. We're not, we don't have any work. What are we going to do? And we said, you know what? We're going to go out and build a brand, continue to build our brand. We're going to build it by being helpful and caring like we always have. We're just going to be doing it differently. Right. And I don't know how long that, you know, I, I don't know what it means right now, which I think is great, but I do know it's going to pay off in so many ways that we can't even anticipate right now. And I think that's what creativity is. You stay creative and stuff, you'll eventually find something that clicks, something that ticks, something that um, maybe is a big change for your business or for your profession. 
So, you, you know, I'm listening to you and, and it's, it's inspiring in me just a realization that, you know, you and I, we're, 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 we're creatives, right? I mean, we see our, our, in, our thoughts and our creativity as a tool to use and that it needs to be used and needs to be, we need to do things with this. And, and everything good and the only way we're going to get out of this situation is people that think the same way. Think of people that are, are people that are solution finders, you know, people that are, look at, look at a bunch of things they're used to saying, rearrange them and find a new path. And I think that since you do this, you do that in all ways with your work, you do that in, in life, you, 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 you explore things and you challenge yourself going forward, it, which still amazes me how good the beer you brew is because you make it at home and it's fantastic and I love that beer. And I think that, anyway, that's a whole other thing. We should talk about, we should do creativity and making beer one of these days. We should do one of those. We, should, we, we certainly could do that. Yeah, <laughs> because that's why I know that's one of your loves. You know, it's right. funny. Is my, my brother is surpassing me in beer making now. Which oh, is, wow. I have oh. had all my stuff locked up in a storeroom for, since November. He's, he's making two batches a month and three, yeah. three Oh, anyways, I yes. almost love I your brother as much as I love you, man. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I love that guy. That guy is so great. But, um, but anyway, yeah, I think, I think that that's important. I think that, that in talking to you, uh, I think that, that, that encourages me and the, my, and the reason that I've made this a priority in my life and trying to put it out there is to encourage that in others. And, it, and it's encouraging to me that I'm going to continue trying to do this and reaching out to people like you and, and all the people I talk to now and really tap into some of that, that creativity. It's so valuable and important. So we're, we're friends. We're good friends. And, and I appreciate you taking the time to share that side that we don't really tap into too often. We experience it together, but we don't want to talk yeah. about it that much. So this is our chance to actually talk about it. And I appreciate you taking the time to do that with me. Oh, I enjoyed it. Thanks yeah. for having me. So um, anyway, thanks. Thanks. All information about Craig and I'm going to put it all on, on the post here in, in his, his website for his company is going to be down below. And then we'll, I'll talk to him after if there's anything else he wants me to share. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll go ahead and do that. But um, anyway, thank you for taking the time and hopefully we'll, we'll have a, an interesting talk on the next one. All right. Sounds good. Take care. Thanks. Bye.